Welcome to Streams of Income with self-help author Ryan Rieger. For the next hour, you'll hear proven methods for how to live the multiple income streams dream. Ryan is passionate about helping others discover their gifts and start their own business. He's published five books, and his courses and group coaching programs have changed the lives of thousands of students all over the world. Ryan's books include Private Label, The Easy Way, Finding Your Grace Place, and his latest, Streams of Income. And now, here's your host, Ryan Rieger. Hey guys, welcome back to the Streams of Income radio show. I'm your host, Ryan Rieger, and boy, am I excited about this one. In today's episode, I am chatting with Dan Miller. He's the author of 48 Days to the Work and Life You Love. That's the title of his 20th anniversary edition of his book. But Dan has been a mentor to me. I'm honored to call him friend. He has a podcast called 48 Days. Guys, I've learned a ton from this guy. And so I'm just so thrilled to be able to share this with you. If you don't have his book, 48 Days, grab it. Um, There will be a link in the show notes, but it's 48days.com forward slash Ryan. There's a special uh, download there. You can actually download a free chapter at that link, but that link will be on the show notes of this episode, uh, streamsofincomeradio.com. And guys, I'm super excited to share this with you. Uh, Again, Dan is somebody I I sincerely look up to. I've learned a ton from him, his team, his community. So here's my interview with Dan Miller. All right, well, Dan, welcome to Streams of Income Radio. I really appreciate you being on with me. I'm sorry it took me this long to have you on, but I appreciate you doing this. Well, I have the 20th anniversary edition of a book, which you'd think would come out in January, but it didn't. It didn't come out until June. That's so, all right. Perfect so timing. Your, your timing is perfect. Yeah, I saw that uh, your team sent out an email about, hey, do you want to interview Dan for your podcast? Yes, of course. <laughs> Duh, no brainer. Um, guys, this is Dan Miller, and uh, I, uh, I count him as one of my uh, – almost get emotional about this. Um, a, a, a wonderful friend, uh, definitely a mentor. Uh, I put him right up at the top with a lot of the people that I've learned from. Um, definitely up there with Jim Cockrum. You guys know how I feel about Jim, but he's the author of 48 Days to the Work You Love. And the anniversary edition says to the work and life that you love. So I'm excited to dig into that. But first I met I'll tell you how I met him, and then, Dan, I'll maybe have you introduce yourself, some of your, your quick background and all that, and then we'll dig into some of the book. But it was CES3. It was uh, Jim's now called the Proven Conference. It was in Louisville, Kentucky, 2015. Dan was the keynote speaker for that, and being on Jim's team, um, I was able to go, come the night before for a meeting that he uh, Jim always has with the, the moderators and the leaders. And Dan, you showed up at that uh, pre-conference, just get together the night before. It was kind of late. And you were talking to folks there and you wanted to, you were selling your books there. You didn't bring a whole lot. You only had a box, I think. But I happened to be standing at the back of the room when you were about to go upstairs to grab your books to put them on the book table. And so right place, right time. I believe, honestly, it wasn't just coincidence. It was a God thing that I was right there and you asked me, hey, do you wanna run upstairs with me to my room and help me bring these books down? And I, of course, gladly did that. And because of that, you gave me one of the books, the, you know, that version then, and I devoured it as soon as I possibly could after that conference. And Dan, it changed my life. Um, I, it, I don't mean that lightly. And now I'm, you know, because of that, I, I went to your coaching with excellence program. I went through that, I went to Franklin, Tennessee. And then soon after, signed up for Coaching Mastery. So I'm an actually uh, uh, one of your certified coaches and have plugged into your Eagles community. Guys, he has an awesome community of Eagles that uh, it's you know, teaching you how to start a business. If you've never started a business before, that's a great place to go and learn from other people. It's an awesome, supportive community. But I've gotten to know you over the last few years, and I'm just – I consider it an honor that you're on this podcast with me and thanks for what you've invested into my life. And it's just uh, kind of surreal to have you chatting with me right now on this podcast. So welcome and thank you. Well, thank you, Ryan. My goodness. Sometimes I need to be refreshed on those 
first meetings, um, I have a privilege of meeting a lot of people, and sometimes I don't remember the details. But yeah, now, now that you mentioned that, I, I remember that. You helped me in our first meeting, helped me carry books down for CES. You wow. Yes. Looked into that group. And of course, you're connected with Jim Cochran. That group was so responsive. Yes. Because they're people who are already in the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot different right. than talking to people who have never taken an idea and experimented with it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's typical of a lot of people I get the pleasure of meeting, but that's you know, my, the whole thing that I'm doing, you know, started as a little Sunday school class. I never had any intention of this turning it into a business, but the, wow. the group there was so responsive. And I thought in that Sunday school class, Ryan, that I'd have, you know, the 22 year old who just lost their job at Burger King and was looking for a new job. Yeah. Well, I had a few of those. Uh -huh. But surprising to me, I also had dentists and attorneys and physicians and pastors and engineers and accountants who are saying, you know what, everybody thinks I'm doing okay, and I am, but I don't think this is it. Yeah. I think something more than this. So I was moving into that amazing space, helping people really go deeper, introspecting, introspection into themselves to see, you know, what are those unique talents that God has given me to maybe do something a little bit different than everybody else, Yeah, really kind of come into my own. So I've been walking out that journey for a long time now. I love it. Talk about, um, I've, I know you talk about, you know, I've heard you talk about your background before 48 days of the work you love and you know, you're from Ohio Mennonite family. Uh, you got that, uh, the record, um, the, from Earl Nightingale, all of maybe share briefly about some of that past and how it launched you into what you're doing now. Golly. All right. I'll give you a real cliff notes version of that. I grew up on a farm. My dad was bivocational. He was pastor of a little tiny Mennonite church for which there was no salary, of course, in that they practiced the tent making ministries. Uh -huh. So he got a living as a farmer, neither of which was he that excited about. I understood that many, many years later, but he was doing what was responsible, mm -hmm. what other people expected him to do and making it work. We didn't talk about enjoying your work or doing things that expressed your passion. We did things that were the right, we did the right things, mm -hmm. things that were responsible. Yeah. That was really even the theology around that. Just try not to screw up too much here and then you go to heaven and everything will be fun there. <laughs> right. But don't be concerned about what's happening here. Well, as I even, as a kid, you know, read the scripture, I talked about the joy of your work. Mm -hmm. And what a thrill it would be to find your passion. And I started questioning some of the theological framework and have all gone deep into that. But then when I was about 13 years old, somehow I got a hold of that little 33 and a third RPM recording, audio recording, spoken word of Earl Nightingale titled The Strangest Secret. And it says, you become what you think about. Mm. Now, that's not a brand new concept. Even the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But somehow it resonated with me. And I thought, is it really possible for me to change the obvious direction of my life if I just control what I think about? But it came, became a foundation of principle then and remains so today. And I started filling my head with Horatio Alger's stories, stories yeah. about people who took ideas and developed them. And I have followed that. I went on, I left the farm, mm -hmm. much to the dismay of my dad, but I, I did. And time, time is a wonderful healer, incidentally, so things are fine there. Um, but I left and went off to college, mm -hmm. not for a career path, but just for personal exploration. Yeah. Always been an entrepreneur, and even in the farming arena, you know, I learned a little bit about plumbing, electrical, mechanical, agriculture, all those things. It was a great foundation for me to explore and kind of find my own ideas, but I've always just found ideas to pursue. So I've never had a job. I've never had a job yeah. where I got a paycheck or benefits. I've always just pursued ideas. And then it was when I was in my mid forties that mm -hmm. I had had a variety of businesses, some good, some horrendously bad, just uh, making decisions on the fly yeah. and had an opportunity to start teaching that little Sunday school class. Church asked me if I would teach my academic background as in clinical psychology. Uh -huh. Started walking people through these inevitable, relentless career changes that we go yeah. through. And it was in that that I discovered this amazing hunger that people have to find their own authentic path. 
How has God uniquely gifted me? What would that look like if I was expressing that on Monday morning, yeah. rather than just putting in my time for a paycheck? So it's been this process of walking with people through developing amazing ideas that I could never dream up in a million years. So in coaching, speaking, writing in that space, it's created my own entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. You know, even now, right now, I mean, look at what's happened this year. Mm -hmm. There's so much volatility, so many things that have been rocked, so many people that yeah. thought they had security that found out it was just an illusion. Right. But in that period of time, a whole lot of people in our space, you and I, people are discovering new opportunities that they wouldn't have discovered if things had just continued to be okay. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. it's so exciting to be working with those people and helping them develop those ideas and bring them to life. Absolutely. One thing we talk about in this group, Dan, um, talking about the, my insiders group that we have is uh, just getting started. Don't wait until it's perfect. So I'm, I'm holding the 20th anniversary edition of 48 Days to the Work You Love, but it didn't start like this and it didn't look like this at the beginning, did it? No. Tell me about the three ring binder because binder, I use that a lot with my my people and say, Hey, you know what? You have something that's on your heart. You need a book. You have a book, you know, you're supposed to write. Don't wait, get it out there because in today's world, you can, you can throw it up on KDP on Kindle direct publishing and you can edit it at any time. And so you, you started with a three ring binder and now look at what this has become. So talk about that a little bit, how that, how this book got started. There, there's actually even a previous version. Um, People in the Sunday school class started asking for material. You know, people uh -huh. would sit there and they'd say, wow, I've got a son-in-law who's been without work for three months. You know, yeah. I want him to hear what you just told us. You know, what do you have I can give him? Well, I didn't have anything. And I was not looking for a publishing deal. I didn't consider yeah. myself an author. But I finally took, just because of the, the demand, those rough notes I had, and I went to Kinko's and had them spiral bind it. Yes. Spiral binder, and I had a single cassette that went with that. Wow! I started selling that for twenty four fifty, okay. just as a resource for people. And so, as that developed, then I got a little more sophisticated. Put it in a three ring binder, uh -huh. two audio CDs in there. Then I went to a conference in California by, with this guy named. Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of okay. Chicken Soup for the Soul. Yep. I took my buddy Dave Ramsey with us. I said, hey, let's go hear this guy. He, he knows how to sell books. So <laughs> Dave and I took our wives, went there, sat there for three days, listened to this guy, came back. And in the next 18 months, I sold over $2 million worth of that three-ring binder that you're referring to. Oh, my gosh. Then publishers came knocking at my door, you know, which is kind of an interesting process for people to hear that because people have – their idea, they know what they want to write, they hold it close to their chest, and they go try to get a publishing deal. Right. I didn't do that. I just shared what I had with the world. Yeah. People were experiencing, giving me good feedback on it. Mm -hmm. Then publishers came knocking on my door. Then we went to a traditional trade book version of that. Mm -hmm. And then I've updated it every five years. Yeah. So what you have now is yeah, it was updated in 05, 10, 15, and yeah, now 20. 20. You're gonna be, yeah. When are you going to start working on the 2025 version? Well, I already have a document with notes. You really? Oh my I God. absolutely do. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I already have notes for things that will be added in there. That's but awesome. this, this one, now the, the, the challenge is, you know, as an author, how do you keep a book that keeps from becoming 600 pages right, when every right. five years? So I have to decide what I'm going to take out. Yeah. So the basic process of looking at yourself and discovering your skills and abilities, your personality tendencies, your values, dreams, and passions, that process, that core process stays pretty much the same. Yeah. But this book is probably about 70% different from the first version okay. because – now, like now, this is different than in 2015. We've got things about overcoming the upper limit challenge, mm -hmm. how to find your unique zone of genius, yep. the diminishing value of degrees, how to handle artificial intelligence interviews where you may be screened for a job but never talk to a real person. Oh, my gosh. How to be a digital nomad, changing yeah. work models. So it's exciting to me to be able to see the 
continuing changes and yet keep the core message of the book as we yeah. move forward through time. That's good. Do you think that there would be this version if there was, was never the Kinko's version? You know, I don't know. I don't know how I, I can't connect the dots as to how I would have gotten here without that. Yeah. Mm. To me, it was such a natural process, but it's very much like you talk about, you know, uh, the founder of, of LinkedIn, yep. um, Eric, Eric Reed. Anyway, he says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you waited too long. Mm. And I look at that first version. I mean, it was Times New Roman font on the front cover. No graphics, no color. It was yeah. black type on blue background, hard stock paper. <laughs> Am I embarrassed? I mean, not re- that's probably not a good word for it. I mean, it's hilarious to look at right. it, but people didn't care. Yeah. People told their friends and they bought the fire out of that thing. And you took action and now look where it's gotten you. And now you're able to, you had no idea that later on down the road, you'd be having a coaching program and people like me would be learning how to be a coach. I'm not even in the career space. Um, as far as you know, the, the, gen, the regular career space, like what you, what the, this is books about, but there's so much more to this book than just learning how to get a job guys. So even, I know a lot of people in this group, you are employed full time. You, you are an entrepreneur still get this because you're going to learn so much. There's so many nuggets here. The back of the book. One thing I, I read, like, like about this is it says work should be more than a paycheck. Stop dreaming about someday. 48 days from now, you could be in a new position that's not sucking your soul dry or generating income in a creative way that gives you more time and more income. The exploding opportunities are waiting for you. Wow. That is good. So, Dan, I, might, I wrote a book. I, I showed you this a few, probably the first time I met you. This, I don't talk about this book much, but it's called Finding Your Grace Place. Yeah. I quote you a few times in this. Um, let's talk about the just values, dreams, and passions. Because in here, I, I, here's a quote from the, one of the, the version I had then. Money is never enough compensation for investing our time and energy. There must be a sense of meaning, purpose, and accomplishment. Anything that does not blend our values, dreams, and passions will cause us on some level to choke. A life well-lived must go beyond just making a paycheck, even, it's a, even if it's a very large one. Above it, I talk about the, that attorney that uh, wrote you that was stressed out. He said, I feel destined to do something great, but have no idea why or what. I only work for the money. So money is not enough compensation. Uh, talk about the, just blending your skills, your values, your talents, and, and how that, you know, your, your three-legged stool that you talk about. Yeah. Ryan, as you know, having been to my property here multiple times, there's a beautiful eagle carved out of a cedar tree just as in the approach to my office. What are you going to do with that, by the way? <laughs> that stays with the property. Oh, man. I'm, there's no way I'm going to cut you that. You can't cart that to Florida? <laughs> it's, a, it's a standing tree, and it needs to stay oh, for the man. Owners. I hope they appreciate it as we have. Yeah. But that tree didn't come back to life several years ago. And being a farm kid, I hate losing a tree. So I thought there's got to be something we could do with that. So I talked to a sculptor, had her come out here, and I said, Terry, I think there's an eagle trying to get out of that tree. She walked around it for a little while, didn't say much, and finally she says, you know what, I think you're right. So then I had it topped at about 14 feet off the ground. She came out, we set up scaffolding, she went to work and released this eagle that was there all the time. Now, there's a lot of metaphors there. A lot of times when we think something died, it's just getting ready to release something even more beautiful. Well, my point in terms of your question is that you are not going to meet with your guidance counselor as a sophomore in college and have that person say, gee, you ought to grow up and be a tree carver. It's not going to happen. Right. When right. you go to school or to college, you're going to be given a list of very traditional occupations. So you're going to see teacher, dentist, physician, attorney, pastor, engineer account, and you're going to choose one of those. Mm -hmm. But that's a very, very short list of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I meet with the 42-year-old attorney who says, this is nuts. You know, this, but here's the thing. A lot of times those people have proven their ability to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. 
but mm. they hate the life they've created. Mm. So that was what I was unpacking. What is going on there? Well, they have the ability, the skill and ability, mm -hmm. but their personality isn't a match. It doesn't blend their passions and dreams. So just having mm -hmm. the ability is never enough to determine a career path. Now that that's interesting, even in in you know your space in the online world, there are a lot of people trying to model what Jim Cockrum did or what somebody down the road did, you know, what Uncle Harry did, and they're trying just to model that. There's value in that in terms of exploration, but if it doesn't really connect with you personally, you'll burn out. Mm. It, money is not enough to keep you there. Yeah. So the same thing is true, whether it's a profession or even something entrepreneurial. If it's just the money, you're going to have a hard time getting yeah. with it on Monday morning. But if it's something that you love, absolutely love doing, you think it brings value to people, mm -hmm. then the money is a nice byproduct. Sure. And that's sure. essentially what it is. Yeah. Do you feel like, because we talk about three ways to make money online, and one of them being selling physical products, you know, that's not necessarily something that people just love to do. It's about that, that becomes a vehicle for them to do some other things. So, you know, I think Oprah says, do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. Um, <laughs> Jim also says, you know, uh, that you may not love selling physical products, but once you start seeing it successful, then the passion may, may end up being there. Do you think that that can happen? Like you, you start seeing some success and then the passion's there for selling physical products or do you think though those things that we teach like selling on Amazon just become a revenue generator to then give you that money that then, okay, now I can focus on writing that book because initially writing that book's not going to bring me a whole lot of money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, you have bits and pieces all through there and so many different applications. I do believe that, you know, in another, another book that I have wrote with my son, Jared, is Wisdom Meets Passion. Mm -hmm. Great book, by the way. Passion, thank you. Passion oftentimes is more developed than it is discovered. That's you know, good. I ran into somebody that, gee, I don't know what her passion is. Well, it's not that she go out and sit on a tree stump and wait for that bolt of lightning insight. No, get involved in something. I yeah. don't know if Michael Jordan was passionate about basketball when he was a little mm -hmm. kid, but he started doing it. And he kept mm -hmm. doing it and practiced and got better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And his excellence in doing that then developed the passion to do even yeah. more of that. And I think that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, you can also take a path like you described where you're doing something. And so it, it gives you $100,000 a year. You know, so you've got that. You, you aren't going to be concerned about putting groceries on the table. So then that gives you some time freedom to mm -hmm. really go deeper in an individual passion. Yeah. But, but I don't think they should be mutually exclusive. Okay. And I think you, I, I told somebody just the other day, he was talking about how he was going to, he's a real expert in a particular kind of software and he's known for that. So he's developing courses and everything in there, but he hates doing it. Mm -hmm. But he wants to get his courses built up, get other people doing this and all of that so he can kind of step aside. And I said, man, you are going down the wrong path. Don't try to build a business that you don't want to run. Mm. I think ultimately mm. we don't want to try to build something, even if it's providing income and significant income, there still has to be more than that. Right. I mean, I, I like to sell books, but we know that the average author in America does not make more, 95% of authors in America don't make more than $40,000 a year. Well, that can do two things. It can be really discouraging to me and say, well, Heck, I want to be an author, but I don't want to do that because I want more money. No, if I really want to be an author, then I'm going to look at how tough can it be to put myself in the 5% of people who mm -hmm. knock it out of the park. I just simply am going to do things that most authors don't do. Right. So I always look at it like that. What is a unique application that I can find in this thing that I care about mm -hmm. so I can have both the engagement of my passion and extraordinary financial success? That's good. One of the new things in the book is the, about the zone of genius. I've heard you talk about this many times because it comes from what's uh, the, the big leap of, from Gay Hendricks. Is that right? That's one of the places, yeah. And, but being in there, you know, learn, just hanging out with you a lot, I hear you talk about your zone of genius. You said one time that uh, you would be happy if you were just, you know, stuck in a, in a room 
the door shut and you're just writing and Joanne would bring you peanut butter sandwiches under the door. Is that right? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you found like your zone of genius is writing and obviously it, it shines through with this. Um, mm. How does somebody figure out, you know, I know that so you'll, you're, it's easy to know the things you hate, you know, there's tasks <laughs> we all do and we're trying to get better at it of like for me doing maintenance around the home that is just not my thing. I would just much rather hire that out. I know I have a, I'm happier. There's less frustration. My wife's happier. If I have somebody come and do those things, that's not my zone of genius. How do people find what their zone of genius is and try to make sure that they're focusing more on that and lessening the time that they're doing these, those other things that suck their time and aren't that aren't those things that give them life. Yeah. we really, when you have a little bit of life experience, you ought to be able to look at the things you're doing and start to narrow, categorize, and refine those pretty quickly. I'm in a program called Strategic Coach. Mm -hmm. So in there, we use different terminology, but we go through identifying, and I went through, so I, I took like 70 things that I do, mm -hmm. and then I identified those as incompetent, things that I shouldn't be doing. You know, if it's spraying for bugs around the sanctuary or going to Office Depot for staples or whatever, just right. things like that, incompetence. Uh -huh. But things, things that seemingly have to be done shouldn't be my area. And then we look for areas where I am competent. So I do it pretty well, and people know me for doing that okay. Uh -huh. Usually includes a lot of things. Then things where I'm excellent. Now, these are things would even be like being an author, speaker, coach. Okay. People recognize you for doing those, mm -hmm. but probably somebody else could step into that space pretty easily as well. Okay. Then we look for what is your unique ability mm -hmm. or what I use the term, what is your zone of genius? What is it that only you can do? What is it that distinguishes you from other authors, speakers, online sellers out there? Mm -hmm. What is that? Now, what, when I first did that, I was spending about 25% of my time in that area of incompetence mm -hmm. and about 25% of my time in the area of my zone of genius. Mm -hmm. Doing this a long time, and then the others were spread a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. My goal, though, is to get to where I'm spending 75% of my time in my zone of genius. Okay. Now, Michael Hyatt, in his free to focus materials, mm -hmm. he takes, again, a ranking like that using different terminology, but in what I called incompetence, those you eliminate. Let's get those out of your life. Mm -hmm. Those that are in the area of competence that mm -hmm. you do well, but somebody else can do, delegate those. Mm -hmm. Those in your area of excellence, mm -hmm. systematize, create systems for the repetition of those. And then your yeah. zone of genius, enlarge. Yeah. I love that because I pull from lots of people to create yeah. my own kind of framework, but that framework has really helped me mm -hmm. so that I have, I'm very strategic about my time usage. And at this point I have two days a week, Thursday and Friday, where I have no appointments, no commitments. Well, commitments other than what I call deep work. Those are the days when I work on the things that I most enjoy for me getting through the week to those days. I mean, it's like getting to the piece of apple pie after you eat your Brussels sprouts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's good. good yes. I get to spend yeah. all day by myself, no interruptions. And that's when I create yeah. content. I think, study. Yeah. yeah. What do those days look like for you? So you said you think, study, you're, you're obviously writing. Do you have a, you know, like a plan? So those two days would be tomorrow. And as we're recording this on a Wednesday, so yes. what do you have planned? I mean, I guess this may, things may be different right now because you're in, in a move process. So you may be doing some, possibly doing other things tomorrow and Friday that you wouldn't normally, but take me back a year ago. What does Thursday and Friday look like for you? You know, those are so important to me that the, tomorrow and the next day are right on track. Really? Wow. Oh, awesome. my. Yeah. Okay. I am right. I am right in the middle uh -huh. of, I am so excited about this. I can't stand it. <laughs> but my next book, here, here's what's happened. Every Sunday morning, I get up and write a short piece that's mm -hmm. more philosophical, spiritual. I call it Sabbath musings. It goes out just to my mastermind members. So just a very tiny group, and that's it. But people in that group who know me well and have for years tell me that without question, it's my best writing, my best content. Wow. 
Yeah. I'm now putting together, no, no, and the one that I did this past Sunday uh-huh. was number 167. Okay. So those are about 700 words in length. So if you do the math on that, that's way more than the content for a book. Okay. So now I don't sit down and just write from a vacuum. I've got tons of content and I'm pulling that together. And the first volume is going to be called An Understanding Heart. Wow. But it's going to be done like this. Now, this is Duck Dynasty little devotional. Is that leather? And leather bound? Five by seven leather. Five by seven Wonderful. gold edge pages, mm-hmm. bookmark. It's almost counterintuitive because we know we can put something on, on Kindle. Sure. Because, so there's no production cost at all. I'm going retro. I'm yeah. going back okay. where a book is something heavy. It's almost like sacred when you have it in your hand. Yeah. And it's going to come out and it's going to be way more expensive than a book should be. Yeah. It defies every principle of publishing. <laughs> Publishers just get all in a frantic, you get their panties in a wad. When I start talking about leather, you know, heavy right, book, right. illustrations inside and all that, but yeah. that's, I've already got it all laid out that we printed awesome. in China. Okay. So I'm working You're doing on that. that. You're basically doing that on your own. I am, but I already have because of my great relationships with publishers. I already have a distribution agreement where they've agreed to buy them anyway. But here's the thing. You would expect, you know, a little book that has, you know, 230 pages in it to maybe be, you know, $12. Uh No, this will probably be $48. I think I'm just going to go with my signature number, $48. But here's the thing. Do you know Ryan Holiday, who wrote The Daily Stoic? Uh, no, I've heard you talk, of, talk about. Obstacle yeah. is the way, uh-huh. ego is the enemy. He writes in that space. Yeah. Anyway, he's got a book, The Daily Stoic. Okay. Well, it came out four years ago, and it's done really well, multiple translations and all that. Yesterday, he announced a special edition of that. Wonderful. Leather, gold edge pages, Bookmark yeah. ex- comes in a gift box with the logo on the front. Yeah. $99. Wow. And I, I mean, it wasn't 15 seconds when I saw that and I ordered my, because it so resonated with me so yeah. that you can tell I'm excited about it. That's what I'm yeah. working on on mm. my deep work days because I'm really close to pulling the trigger. I okay. just need to work with an editor for layout okay. on that. Okay. But I've already got all the specs, the publishing uh, the specs, the cost, and everything, all ready to go on that. Wonderful. Yeah. Any oh, idea, of, or if you don't have to, if you don't want to say, you don't have to. But the, when that might be ready for sale, potentially. Well, this is. I mean, it's it needs some lead time because of where it's being produced. Sure. But I hope to have copies in November, awesome. so we have them before. Before Christmas, that'd season. be a great Christmas gift. Sign me up for yeah. one or two or three or all right. I mean, give them out as gifts to people in this community here. So. Ah, yeah, it's going to be called an understanding heart. That's first, awesome. First edition of that. Love it. I want a signed copy. All right. <laughs> so, Dan, another thing you talk about, I know that be applicable to people in my audience is the whole fifteen hours a week principle. Um, because people ask me, gosh, how am I going to, how can I build a side hustle, a side income? I'm working full time. Uh, I don't really like my job necessarily. I want to get out of it, but golly, I'm working 40 to 60 hours a week at this thing. And I feel like I don't have time to start that side hustle. You have like a pretty laid out formula and like percentages of what you, how much you spend on what activity that I know will be very applicable to folks that uh, are listening to this. This is, I, I love that you brought that up because it's such a trap that people fall into. They're working a job. They really want to start a side business of some kind, and we commend mm-hmm. them on doing that. And so they carve out 15 hours a week, and we believe that anybody can find that just in discretionary time. Sure. You need to kind of back into that. So 15 hours, you can build a viable business. But we find people who have their business idea, and six months later, they've been to three conferences, Mm -hmm. they've listened to 70 podcasts, they've read 15 books, they've bought courses, and they've never put a penny in their bank account. Mm. They don't have a business. They may have a hobby of some kind, but they don't have a business. Mm -hmm. So we discovered people need to divide their time into four categories if they're really building a business, and in doing so, 
you can have a business from week one. But in that 15 hours, I encourage people to spend three hours of that learning, reading, studying, talking to other people, going to, you know, going through courses, whatever. Three hours. So it's 20%. Mm -hmm. Five hours is then creating content. Now that's going to mm -hmm. vary, but it could be a gathering product in your case or mm -hmm. working on your manuscript. Five hours doing that. Four hours working directly with clients, customers. Mm -hmm. So right out of the gate, if you've got something for sale, how are you going to tell people about that? Mm -hmm. And then the remaining three hours is directly in marketing. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You know, we, we've got a, a document that has 48 marketing tips in it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do all of them, but you need to figure out what are the three or four things you're going to do. Yeah. If you're going to use Facebook ads, then learn how to do them really, really well. Yeah. If or hire Greg blog, Tosi, our friend. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Or if you're going to blog, yeah. boom. How you gonna, if you're going to podcast, do it consistently. Yes. Be real, there's nothing that builds trust like mm -hmm. consistency. Mm -hmm. So if you divide your time like that, so you're, you know, reading, studying, you know, we've got you know, reading, creating content, working with clients, marketing mm -hmm. are the four areas. And in doing that, We've seen people that have gotten to the point where they're, they're uh, generating 50% of their current income mm -hmm. within like 90 days. Mm. That's, a real, that's a real tipping point. Yes. If somebody can get to where they're generating 50% of their current income, wow, we can see the trajectory and know that if they took the remaining time they're now spending on their job and put it into this, they can yeah. close the gap and be off and running. That's good. Yeah, I talk. We have. I have a lot of people that come to me asking, "Man, when's the right time to quit my job?" And it's like, oh. well, you know, you need to pray about that. That's a big decision. I don't want to be responsible for you for uh, leaving your job and something not working right. But so pray about it. Talk to your spouse for sure. If you want something more practical, I definitely say, well, my friend Dan Miller talks about fifty percent. If you're at that fifty percent mark, that's when you can at least start thinking about that. Um, so that's very good advice. If, would you do the same percentages if somebody only has 10 hours or they have 30 hours divided up the same percentage? I would. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Now, it, really, when you start to go to 30 to 40 hours, you may not need to spend 20% of that time in the additional learning. You mm -hmm. may be able to, to back off on that, but certainly not in the engagement with customers or marketing. Those yeah. percentages you want to stay strong. And it's, yeah. it's easy for people when they get a little momentum to back off on the marketing. Yes. And then all of a sudden they're experiencing, you know, the, the entrepreneur roller coaster. Right. Things are great. Oh, gee, you mean I need to go market this? Yeah, you do. So you need to learn yeah. how to do that. Hey, there's yeah. one other thing I want to throw yeah, in that you I'm sure you've experienced in your community. As a matter of fact, when I was at CES that you talked about, that mm -hmm. time where you and I first met, uh -huh. I'll never forget, there was a young gal who grabbed me after I did my presentation Mm -hmm. uh, real, real attractive gal. She'd gotten into this online world mm -hmm. and was just crushing it. Yeah. I talked to her for about three minutes and I said, and, and it was clear she was not happy. So in as much as she had gotten out, was making a whole lot more money than she'd made previously. There was something uh -huh. I said, do you miss being part of a team? Do you miss uh -huh. the camaraderie of you? She's, Oh, yeah. I am so lonely. I can't stand it. <laughs> yeah. I said, golly. Do yourself a favor. Go get a job. Mm. So we have, yeah. we have to make sure this is not just a natural ladder that everybody needs to go up right. to become an entrepreneur. For some people, we've got people in our community who are extremely successful and they kept it at 15 hours a week because yes. they do like being part of a team. So what you end up as a work model, there's a broad continuum of possibilities don't think that you always kill the regular job and just become a raving entrepreneur right, as right. you progress. No, I, I recently had Patrick McGinnis on. I, um, I was just looking him up because I remember that's, oh. a, that's the 10% <laughs> entrepreneur you're talking about. I was going to ask you about him. Patrick is a multimillionaire. Yeah. He, he's an investor in companies. Uh -huh. He wants to be a 10% entrepreneur because he loves the corporate environment and what mm -hmm. you can do with teams and yeah. creating vision for younger people in there and all that. A 10% yeah. entrepreneur. Mm. So, and again, what, what a opportunity. I mean, how yeah. golden is that to know that we've got the choices 
where we can make this so personalized for what Absolutely. it's us. Yeah. Are you, um, you're, you're more the type of guy you, you're totally fine, you know, kind of doing this behind a computer in your office. Correct. Uh, but there's folks that, um, need that. How, how would you suggest having that connection when you're doing this? Uh, you're more of an, int- more of an extrovert type of person. How do you keep those uh, connections happening when you're doing this online? And you don't, let's say that a job is not the, the direction that you should go. Yeah. Well, we, we get to create our own path. Uh-huh. My schedule is on Mondays, I handle everything related to business. Mm-hmm. So business meetings start at eight o'clock Monday morning, anything involving administrative things, vendors, new equipment, computer software, that's all done on Mondays. Mm-hmm. Tuesday is a coaching day for me. So all my coaching, our coaching mastery call, my mastermind call, all those things that happen on Tuesday. Wednesday, Wednesday morning, I open that magic email box uh-huh. and read the questions that people have submitted and I do my podcast, which is answering listener questions. Yeah. Wednesday afternoons, as we're doing right now, is available for interviews. That's the only time during the week. Yeah. Thursday and Friday, deep work. Your deep work, I love it. Now, if I were an extrovert, if I really needed more contact with people, uh-huh. Schedule lunch meetings yeah, three times you. a week. I'd be on committees in my community. You know, yeah. I'd be in networking groups for the industries that I'm in. Uh, I'd go to conferences more than I do. Easy to do. It'd just be subtle changes to give me more personal connection with people, so I wouldn't feel right. isolated and alone. Yeah, very smart. Yeah, like you, you usually go to the social media marketing world conference and your whole mastermind group is, you know, there typically, and that's just a great time to get, have that connection. So, and I, and I, um, I don't want to diminish at all the value of relationships. Mm-hmm. And I go to those conferences more for the connection with people that I may only sure. see once a year than I do for sure. new content. Yeah. Right. Content is easy to get, right? But nurturing relationships, you know, there's still a lot of value in meeting face-to-face, breaking bread together. Absolutely. Are you going to miss the Mexican place there in town that you always go to? Yes, I am. But I've already identified one where we're moving okay. to. Good. There's, there's a place called Tijuana Flats. Okay. There are some others that are really, really good. We are not going to be lacking for good places good. to hang out. That's awesome. Well, we're going to – I miss going to your – your location there, you have a beautiful office and beautiful, uh, you call it the sanctuary. So I'm glad I had the opportunity to do that before you move. So it was fun. Well, good. Yeah, we've had the pleasure of having a lot of people here over the years. We've been here 20 years mm-hmm. in a wow. great season. Uh-huh. Sanctuary, this old converted barn that I worked uh-huh. in. Incredible. Outside. I've got yeah. sculptures and flowers and water features out there. So. But, but I can do that. See, that, sure. that's the thing. You know, it's mm-hmm. not that I can only create that in Franklin, Tennessee. I'm going to create right. a, a beautiful environment in which to work mm-hmm. anywhere in the world where I happen to yeah. be. So Absolutely. it's going to be in Florida for this next season. Love it. We'll have to come visit you there. So um, one other question, and we'll wrap this up here, is you know, just I have entrepreneurs in my audience, and I, we have a lot of the same type of audience, especially the Eagles group that I'm in that I help out in is, is similar to the folks that are um, in some of the communities I have. What do you, what advice would you give them for just, you know, getting started, increasing their business? And you could probably go a million different directions on this. You talk about the Venn diagram and all that, but anything on your heart that you feel like just some encouragement to folks that are building businesses right now. Well, it kind of relates to what we just talked about in that seldom do people achieve extraordinary success by themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have people, Deanna Powers, a young single gal, an Mm -hmm. attorney. Mm -hmm. She took a very responsible route, went to school, went to law school, had a job, made it $78,000 a year. They valued her there in a small firm. She was terrified about security. And I said, don't rock the boat with what you're doing. Let's take this 15 hours Mm -hmm. and start with that. She did that beginning of 2017 in January. And by October, she had generated over $100,000 a year wow. on her side gig. Yeah. By the end of the year, it was 127. Anyway, mm-hmm. we escalated that. She reduced her hours at the firm. And last year, she broke $500,000. Mm. The real key in that was not just having the right knowledge. It was mm-hmm. 
sharing the experience and being on the path with other people going in the same direction. Yep. The, the, the camaraderie that you get there, even if it's not a place that you go at eight o'clock in the morning, but being connected with other people in a community like you have, where people are in going in the same direction together is a critical, critical element. And people who deprive themselves of the wealth of knowledge, the wisdom experience, the ideas, the resources are, are lengthening their own process if they yeah. aren't connected in that way. Awesome. Great advice. Thank you. Guys, if you want, I just uh, Dan and his team set up a special link for me, 48days.com forward slash Ryan. I'm looking at it right now. You can get a free chapter of his new book. You can take the, take the life you love quiz. Um, there's a bonus after you purchase at Amazon, but 48days.com forward slash Ryan. The link will be in the show notes. But guys, get this book. I promise even if you have no desire, you're, you're not in the same boat as far as you're looking for another job. Uh, you're, you know, There's a lot of information about that, of course, in here. But I haven't had a real job since 2008, and I, I love this book. It's meant so much to me, and it's opened up so many doors. You know, Reading this book a lot brought me to working with you, Dan, taking your coaching uh, mastery program and just getting to know your, your team and all the people that are in your circle. And it's a, a wonderful group of people. So thank you for doing this for me. This, uh, doing this with me, I'm proud to, proud to call you a friend and mentor and just so glad that you take your precious time and be on my podcast. Well, there's no greater honor for me than to see people like you who take the ideas and do something with them and create the life that you love. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, I never get tired of hearing those stories. Yeah, sometimes me either. That's apologize. why I do this. That's why you do it too. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people apologize. That, oh, I'm, so, I'm sure you get tired of hearing these stories. No, no. I don't. No. I don't. <laughs> Tell me your story. Yeah. But seeing what you've done has been an, an honor for me, Ryan. Uh, well, thank you very much. I hope to have you back on and hope to see you in florida and meet at, meet at tijuana flats there you go we can do it <laughs> all, right. all right thank you sir you've been listening to streams of income with self-help author ryan rieger from right here in the dallas metroplex ryan teaches several entrepreneurial courses and group coaching programs to students all over the world be sure to listen next week at the same time for streams of income with ryan rieger